Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Carl. Nice to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Are you excited to talk about one of our favorite movies? I absolutely am. I'm so excited that we we're able to pull this together. Yes. Um, so yeah, we here at the USS Constitution Museum love Master and Commander. Um, it is a movie that uh, we often share when we are training the crew of USS Constitution as well as with our own staff. And it, it's a fan favorite. Yeah, it absolutely is. This, is, uh, this movie depicts uh, warfare as well as life at sea uh, in this time period pretty much better than anything that Hollywood's ever put uh, put up on the screen before. Uh, a great deal of effort went into the historical accuracy of this. And because of the time period it represents and some other coincidences that we'll talk about, it also bears a lot of direct relationship to USS Constitution um, and its voyages, which is one of the reasons that we chose it for this movie club. Yeah. So just a couple of housekeeping things um, before we start our presentation. So if you want to ask a question of me and Carl during the presentation, we want you to utilize the Q&A function of our Zoom webinar. So that will give us um, a pop up that you have a question and we'll be answering questions throughout the presentation. If you want to go and introduce yourselves and talk amongst your um, fellow participants, you would want to use the chat function, um, which is also available on the bottom kind of panel. Um, and that will allow you to kind of talk and chat with everyone involved. Um, and then we will also be doing some polling throughout this webinar. Um, and we're going to launch our first one right about now. So because we want to get a sense just how much of fans of Master and Commander we are dealing with here. <laughs> All right. So the question is, how many times have you seen Master and Commander? Carl, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm definitely in the too many times to count function. <laughs> yeah, I, I am definitely in that boat as well, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, no matter how many times you watch it, I feel like I still end up, part of one of the reasons I like it is that uh, I still end up uh, calling, you know, something new out of it. Yeah, it really is. It's so full of detail. Um, and I feel like also as you get to know more about life at sea and what it was like um, on, for Constitution sailors, it also, I end up picking up new things as I watch, um, which is always kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So it seems like a lot of people have voted. We're just missing a couple of people. Um, but just for anyone that um, either is not as familiar with Master and Commander, um, this is based off of the uh, Patrick O'Brien series of books um, and that were very popular, that detail kind of Captain Jack's um, Aubrey and Dr. Stephen um, Maturn's adventures as they kind of travel the world together um, and apart. And Master and Commander is kind of a, a start of some of those adventures. Yeah, the book series has uh, been incredibly popular for a really long time, um, in part because O'Brien did such a phenomenal job of capturing not only sort of the nature of life at sea and, and life in the Navy at the time period, but also the rest of sort of the colloquialisms, the language, the politics and pop culture um, of, the, of that turn of the 19th century. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to share um, the results of our poll with everyone. So <laughs> it, <laughs> Um, I don't think that's too surprising, right? With such a popular movie like Master and Commander that about 40% of us have seen it way too many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is not surprising at all. <laughs> and, and thank you to the, you know, the 28% um, of you that have only seen it, you know, either zero times or once. Uh, you're going to get a crash course in some of the nuances of this movie. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of nuances of it, too. Yeah. Um, you know, part of what made this movie so successful was the fact that uh, it's not a lot of CGI, um, that it actually is using uh, real ships. 
um, and a couple different uh, in a couple different ways. Um, the uh, the film is uh, shot uh, using uh, a ship that had been built as a replica of a British frigate um, during the uh, for the American Revolution. It was uh, built in 1970, the HMS Rose, and so it was a real full size uh, British frigate. Uh, and that was one of the primary ones used, but then because they couldn't accommodate everything else that was needed um, on board that vessel, uh, some storm scenes and other things, they also went and built a full-size replica of it um, that could sit in a floating tank. And um, we were talking about this earlier, Jennifer, refresh, refresh memory. This is the same tank in Baja that they used for Titanic, right? Yeah, this is indeed the same Titanic uh, tank. So it's down at a Fox studio in Baja, um, or Baja Studios in Mexico. So that's kind of our middle image there. Um, when they say that it is a, a, you know, a model, I think that is being um, fairly unkind for that middle ship. It is very large, um, could pretty much hold all of the actors aboard. And that was a lot of the things that they used um, when they were talking about kind of those, those storms and um, anything that you showed, kind of the, the painting, um, the figurehead was certainly done. And then the third model that you see is through um, Weta Workshop in New, Ze New Zealand. So a smaller model, but still very large. It is 25 feet long. Um, and that is where they kind of did some far away shots. So pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, the uh, original ship, uh, which was renamed from HMS Rose to HMS Surprise after the movie, is now uh, at the San Diego Maritime Museum. And the ship itself right now is actually undergoing a restoration. They're having a new deck put on. So much like the restorations that Constitution undergoes, uh, you know, like every other wooden <laughs> ship, it needs restoration after a while. Yeah. Restoration works always constant. <laughs> Um, one of the central things that, um, that one of the reasons we like this movie uh, is that this is a movie with some central themes that resonate both uh, with the history of the U.S. Navy uh, and the history of Constitution. And, uh, and it's sort of reflected, I think, in this uh, opening quote where Jack Aubrey in an argument with Maturin says that, uh, you know, he's doing things he does uh, subject to the requirements of the service. Um, which, you know, Jennifer and I have been talking about this a little bit beforehand about whether or not this was uh, adhering him to the rules or indicating just how much leeway these captains had in deciphering their own rules. Yeah, I think when I first watched it, I thought it was about kind of that personal sacrifice that obviously Stephen has to make um, in terms for the larger good. Um, but yeah, Carl, as we've been talking about, is that, you know, Captain Aubrey definitely had a lot of leeway in terms of some of the decisions that he could make. Um, yeah, you part know. of that reflects too. This, this comes from the quote. Actually, comes from when you know Maturin wants to go. He says, yeah. "Oh, you promised me," and he says, "Yeah, I can do it, but subject to the requirements of the service, that service comes first. Um, which hints at the fact that this is not only a film about leadership and command, but in that particular instance too, this is a buddy movie, uh, right? Like this is the you know the story of the captain and his best friend, the physician. Uh, and how that friendship, uh, you know, reaches a breaking point um, because that friendship is bumping up against these very distinct roles and responsibilities uh, that the captain had for leadership and command of the vessel. Yeah, so I think we should probably look a little bit about what exactly the, the orders that the captain is given. Um, so let's look at those. So this is one of the, the first shots um, in the movie, and it is, you know, to intercept the French privateer Acheron en route to the Pacific, intent on carrying the war into those waters, sink, burn, or take her a prize. Yeah, wow, that's um, pretty direct and pretty dramatic. Um, yeah. <laughs> probably more dramatic than would have likely been the case. Uh, sink, burn, or take her as a prize. Yeah, probably actually, if anything, in the reverse order. Um, but I'm not sure that you would have seen um, a lot of orders, especially for these like far-flung frigates, 
um, uh, because of the fact that their communications were so slim, they were going out for months uh, at a time and you wanted to give them very broad brush orders that met broad uh, strategic or operational goals um, to either intercept shifting, uh, find the enemy, um, and if it was to, you know, to go protect that shipping in another ocean from the potential of privateers, something as specific as intercept this one particular ship and destroy it almost really narrows him down and in a way that is um, neither particularly likely historically or, um, or very, um, you know, accurate given the leeway that he takes in the rest of the movie. Yeah, I think this was something that when we were talking about historical accuracy and I said, you know, that early decision about after that first battle with the Acheron and the ship is in, you know, in a fairly big disarray and a lot of the lieutenants and the sailmaster is saying like, oh, you know, she is a much larger ship of her class. Um, I'm not sure if we should go up against her. We are, you know, I think, you know, with the supplies that we have, we can turn around. Um, and, you know, the captain says, no, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to pursue. Um, initially, I think I was a little taken aback. Um, but, you know, looking at these orders, maybe that's something different. So we kind of want to ask you what your opinion of, was that a good decision? Was that not a good decision? Um, what would you have done in that situation? So I'm going to launch another poll um, and we want to get your opinion of whether or not you would choose to, to turn back or if you would keep chasing. Yeah, so again, the details of those orders are kind of directing him to do that, right? But he also has to do with recognizing that with the damage that he took, uh, you know, did it make more sense to go in? And, uh, you know, and the answers are uh, not always uh, clear cut. Uh, in the case of Constitution, Charles Stewart, um, you know, uh, feeling that he needed to go back um, into port, uh, did go and was ended up facing um, an inquiry, a board of inquiry about why, why are you back here? Why have you cut your crews uh, short so much? Why did you come back instead of uh, staying out? Uh, and there too, you know, he uh, fled larger numbers to even get back to board. Yeah, I know, tough, tough decision. Um, and Carl, you already touched upon this, but we, you mentioned that kind of these orders are so specific versus normally you would get kind of a really broad, um, you know, task to kind of go and, and patrol or look for, you know, this type of activity. Um, and the reason for that, right, is because of the communication of the time period that if you were out at sea, having such a specific order uh, would really kind of hinder you. We see in the movie the challenges of getting a message back home um, when they stop into port to kind of retrofit and we see them kind of sending their mail um, and it's just like, you know, the next ship that is, is going towards England, hand these off. Um, so yeah, it's, I think that's definitely part of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, you know, you as as uh, an admiralty, as uh, the authority over the fleet, you know, you there was no satellite communications, right? And you're not getting email every day going, oh, we've changed our mind, go over here instead. Um, you know, you set orders and this ship sailed over the horizon and that was it for months. And uh, you hope that, um, that they would stay in touch and, and fulfill um, you know, fulfill the goals of their orders uh, as best as they could. And again, also based on the changing circumstances and uh, that they find and the information that they find on the ground. You know, if they discover a fleet somewhere, um, you know, go there, uh, you know, wherever they deem the threat to be. Yeah. And that kind of relates to a, a constitution story. Yeah, I mean, you know, that this idea that these ships were so far flung and traveling all over uh, doing this is reflected in Constitution's cruises during the War of 1812 uh, as well. 
uh, this particular map is actually off of our website, off of um, a series of exploratory uh, pages that you can use to go through the ship's 1812 cruises. Uh, and there's an interactive logbook that allows you to go step by step and see how these decisions were made. You can actually also read the logbooks on our website. Yeah, but really this path is Bainbridge's path on the second cruise during the War of 1812. And he was uh, sent out to find British shipping and, you know, nearly completely crossed the Atlantic looking for it before heading south, uh, all the way down past the islands before cutting back over to South America and, uh, and eventually uh, meeting the enemy off the coast of Brazil. All right, so let's see kind of who amongst our participants are turning back or who is keep chasing. 78% of people are keep chasing. <laughs> um, so I well, thankfully, because that way we still have a movie and a book series. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what do yeah. you think you would have done, Carl, if you were in that, that decision of the captain? You know, it's kind of fascinating in that regard, too, because the, he's, he's continuing to chase, but the decision isn't so much do you continue to pursue. It was the idea that he could actually repair his vessel um, and follow on with a viable pursuit, yeah. um, which is a pretty fascinating idea in its own right. This was not just so much about um, you know, courage or the imagination that you could defeat an enemy when you found him, but the ability to recover from the condition that the ship was in after that first devastating battle um, and do so uh, pretty much self-sufficiently as they do um, uh, off of South America. Yeah. Yeah, I, again, I think I, I kind of gave my answer away. I think my initial reaction was I was kind of with the sailing master and I, I was heading home. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think I think from a lot of our conversations, um, you have you have turned me around. Also, I do not want to be like Charles Stewart and get court court martialed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, you know, and then again, there, that was a slightly different set of circumstances. Yeah. But um, but again, you know, where where do you draw the line too, right? Yeah. Like that is another one of um, of sort of the uh, decisions of command uh, that was. Um, even more difficult when you were completely out of touch with any kind of, of authority or backup or support. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they were trying to uh, meet up where they could. In Stewart's, uh, excuse me, in Bainbridge's case, in the second cruise, uh, he had actually hoped to meet up with uh, Porter, Dave Porter on the Essex when he was down there so that they could um, you know, have that backup and cruise together in those waters in the South Atlantic. But by the time that he had gotten down there, Bainbridge had gotten down there, unbeknownst to him, Porter had actually already rounded Cape Horn and sort of made a, his own unilateral decision that he'd have better effort finding uh, British ships and harassing uh, the whaling fleet in the Pacific and had actually already gone over to, uh, to, to the other side of the world, if you will. Yeah. And that really kind of goes back and illustrates our, our point of just how much control and agencies these captains had when they were out at sea. Um, yeah, it definitely does. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, Ryan on our chat window is saying, let's not forget all the confidence that Aubrey had in his vessel, his crew, and his personal command acumen. He knew those attributes thoroughly as an experienced officer. Uh, you know, that is another example of it too, right? Like, you know, you are willing to push the limits um, as far as you're comfortable based on what you know you can get yourself out of. There's yeah. this classic quote in the storm scene, you know, when, when the crew is beginning to question whether Aubrey knows what he's doing. And like, no, he knows, he knows the ship. He knows yeah. what it can take. He knows, you know, and he knew likewise what he felt the crew could take and, and what they could handle and, and accomplish. Uh, and going back to the repair part, I think that includes that too, that he had faith in his crew's ability to get the ship back up into fighting water. Yeah, pretty incredible. Um, yeah, but of course the, the captain is just kind of one rung on this, th 
this hierarchy of the crew. So obviously he has the most decision-making power, but it is a whole group of people trying to work together to be able to accomplish these missions. And while, you know, they are taking the direction from the captain and looking to, to him for inspiration, it really requires all of them to be able to work in harmony, harmony to be able to accomplish that. And, you know, I think showing hierarchy is really prevalent in the movie. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the hierarchy of, among the crew is definitely one of the sort of the central themes here. And also, mm -hmm. as we see, you know, with, with the failing midshipmen, that breakdown of, uh, of division between these levels of command uh, and roles on board is part of what lends to the central conflict, some of the central conflict uh, among the crew, at least. Yeah. Um, you know, on board in the movie. Yeah. And also, I, I love this little kind of behind the scenes tidbit that the hierarchy continued off screen as well. So the entire crew went through a training process to kind of get familiar with their roles aboard ship. And um, it went even as far as having them all wear different shirt colors to distinguish kind of what role and rank they were aboard ship. So the officers would be wearing blue, the midshipmen a light blue, the crew were in white, and the Marines, of course, were in red. Um, and I just love that little little fact that it continued there. And then it also continues in the credits. Um, if you if you finish the credits, it you know the hierarchy is there, so it's just ever present in the the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, and you know, rightly so that it was so uh, strongly emphasized. And, um, you know, it's emphasized not only in all of those sort of manifest manners, but you see it really brought to life in the, in the physical spaces of the ship. Um, and beginning, you know, with the captain down to the enlisted sailors, we see them physically divided up um, you know, along the spaces of the ship. And, those spaces reflect, um, you know, their roles, their levels within that hierarchy and their responsibilities. Yeah, so I think we should take a little bit of look at the, that hierarchy and those spaces. So we have, of course, first off, we have our captain here, um, Russell Crowe, looking very pensive in his, his captain's cabin. Um, but I love this shot, one, because obviously Russell Crowe, um, but, then, <laughs> but then also just looking at the dressing of this captain's cabin and looking at the grandeur and the space, um, you know, the fact that the, the captain has this luxury of being able to open the windows and get fresh air and fresh light. Um, is something that is really not always something that the rest of the crew has. Um, this silver teapot um, that's kind of very visible in front, I think just gives a, a sense of the, the privileges that a captain gets um, from manning the ship and having all of that responsibility. Yeah, I think that's, you know, among the, uh, the U.S. Navy was uh, very similar to in this regard, and Constitution was certainly no exception. Um, and I think one of the things that always uh, surprises some visitors um, among the items in our, on display in our collection are some of the silver pieces uh, and even glassware that was used uh, by the captain and, uh, uh, and by the officers in dining. Um, that just seems, you know, out of place compared to what we would expect from this rough and tumble world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that one, of course, some of the great scenes that that happen in the, the captain's cabin. Um, one, we obviously get the the wonderful violin and cello scenes, um, <laughs> which you know both actors supposedly did learn how to to play their instruments, though not uh, fairly well. That it was dubbed over, um, but it, that's kind of where you get to see a little bit of really that friendship and that bond between um, the doctor and the captain. Um, they, you know, I think Stefan certainly Stephen, you know toes that line of kind of pushing that boundary of hierarchy, um, especially when they are in the captain's cabin. Um, and, you know, and I think he mentions several times, like, you know, I invite you here as my friend, not necessarily to, to get a lecture. 
So even in this kind of more private space that he has, um, that hierarchy and that check, that that tension um, of the hierarchy still exists. Yeah, you know, uh, and he's the only one though, right? Except for the officers in the, um, you know, except for when they're, the whole group is dining. And so that invitation in is an exception to the isolation and loneliness of, of that command too. But, that, but having the two of them there not only sets you up for uh, what could have been in a whole franchise of buddy movies if this had worked out better. Um, you know, they are the, uh, the duo. Um, but it also uh, provides, I think, a really wonderful mechanism throughout the movie um, to create a conversational foil uh, in, in which um, Aubrey can express to Matern and get feedback from him uh, about the nature of command. And you hear them having discussions about leadership and command and, uh, and you know, the nature of the crew and the role of the situation um, at any given point. Uh, and that, that kind of, it gives our, it gives us, a, I think, a wonderful window into uh, Aubrey's soul that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise have if you didn't have at least one person to talk to. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um. So kind of on our next, you know, the next rung down um, are our officers. So we see both kind of commissioned and warrant officers in Master and Commander. Um, framed in this shot, we see our two lieutenants who are looking very jolly at this particular moment. Um, and you can also see the space that they are in. So they are in their wardroom, which looks very similar to what it would have looked like aboard USS Constitution. Um, including being able to visibly see the, the tiller room um, behind them is pretty cool. Um, but similar to the captain, but maybe not quite as grand, they too have their own kind of separate space from the crew um, where they can um, mix and dine and talk uh, amongst each other. So we can certainly see that here. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a, and, you know, you, you can still also see some of that finery, too, like you yeah. said, um, a little bit of a step up. I do love the tiller. I love, you know, the mechanical features of this vessel um, and the, the myriad uh, details that went into uh, each shot and the composition that provided those elements, you know, the the working tiller behind them are just a wonderful kind of uh, gives you that, reinforces that sense that the ship is continuing to operate even in a scene like this. Very yeah, cool. it is very cool. Um, so, our, after the, the officers, or a part of the officers, are our midshipmen, um, who also have kind of their own space on the ship, though kind of we're, we're kind of being a little bit more amongst the crew, but slightly divided. This was a, you know, they were kind of messing together. This is where they would maybe um, be able to chat and socialize as well as study a little bit. Um, and what would they have been studying, Carl? Yeah, I, you know, I, seeing this picture of these uh, young boys on board, I think if you're unfamiliar with the period um, or, uh, or hadn't, you know, seen anything like this before, like, why are these kids? How could it possibly be that they were so young? Uh, and in fact, they were. Uh, midshipmen were essentially officers in training, and they did start as early as their early teens. Um, and so while they didn't have the same kind of rigid uh, roles and responsibilities on board that other members of the crew and warrant officers may have had, um, they were there to act as uh, literally as officers in training. So part of it was doing their role, performing the roles that an officer would have had. And we see that numerous times throughout the film. Uh, but then also uh, studying and learning. There's this wonderful scene uh, where Aubrey is guiding them all in, uh, in navigation. Uh, and each of them would have to perform uh, you know, navigational calculations and maintain their own copy of what amounted to a copy of the ship's deck log. Uh, that became known as a midshipman's journal. And it was by and large a verbatim um, duplicate of the ship's uh, official deck log. But because each and every midshipman on board was keeping one of them, 
uh, there ended up being far more of them out there than, than obviously the single official deck log. And so from a historian's perspective, midshipmen's journals have been incredibly wonderful, especially for us at the Constitution Museum, uh, because where we've been able to uh, acquire a number of journals kept by midshipmen on board USS Constitution, uh, and, and in a couple of cases, they fill in gaps where uh, there is no deck log book that, uh, that survived to today. So really fun stuff. Um, and the midshipmen, as we see in the film, uh, could go up the ranks and get a uh, officer's commission fairly quickly, or if they were less successful, some of them could languish. Yeah. True. So after our midshipmen, um, we have the enlisted crew. So this is a, an image from the movie of the crew kind of up in the uh, forecastle of the ship. They are, are messing and so they are eating their their dinner and they are socializing and this is kind of you get to see the camaraderie amongst the crew. Um, I think one of the things that is very briefly mentioned in the movie that is kind of an interesting um, thing to consider especially comparing between the HMS Surprise and USS Constitution is that um, Matern does mention that some of these sailors were impressed um, to work there. So we're in the, on USS Constitution, all of the, the sailors would have been um, voluntary. So I think it's pretty amazing to see the camaraderie, uh, the willingness to trust the captain. Um, and I think that he has really a wonderful command of his crew, but it is kind of an interesting thing to have in your back of your mind as you're thinking about the differences between uh, these two vessels. Yeah, and as the third of these, like in our fourth of these major sort of divisions of space and sections, uh, the folks all uh, up forward, um, not only more crowded, but uh, physically the least comfortable, uh, you know, part of the ship. Um, and uh, yeah, and they are clearly very crowded together, um, which, you know, does uh, generate potential camaraderie, but can also uh, generate potential conflict too. Yeah. And then kind of in a, a whole separate division of our, their own, we have our Marines. So here we see our Marines kind of gathered all together. They are hearing their orders um, for the final battle. But the Marines aboard ship were kind of not a part of the, the normal hierarchy, but rather stood alone. As we see in the movie, they have their own captain, Captain Howard, um, who would be kind of helping to command this, this group. Um, and they were essentially the, the soldiers at sea. They were the ones that were helping to keep discipline aboard ship. And then they were also the ones that were in the, the fighting tops, um, helping to do be sharpshooters at the end, as well as they would be kind of going over in the boarding party. So of course we see pretty much the entire crew go over in the boarding party. <laughs> the master and commander. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that too when we get to it. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely some leeway here. The, you know, I, I always, I'm always fascinated by the depictions of the Marines and this stuff because um, I, I think we particularly, you know, uh, in the U.S. Uh, have a perception of the, the Marine Corps that is largely generated from history that begins with World War II. Um, the Marines of this time period in the U.S. Navy in 1812 and Constitution were actually among the lowest paid people on board. Um, and, uh, and, while they had a uh, separate uh, sort of hierarchy and, and set of responsibilities and officers to respond to, um, you know, they were essentially at the level of, of the seamen and not, uh, not particularly highly respected and didn't really have the cachet and reputation that, uh, that the U.S. Marine Corps would, would generate later. Um, so it's kind of fascinating in that regard to, to see how, it, you know, how it's represented here and how much of it um, the U.S. You know, sort of adapted from the Royal Navy. Um, and of course we kind of see once this, you know, this hierarchy that we have seen kind of form starts to break down. That's one of the things that is explored in Master and Commander um, with Midshipman Hallam and the 
you know, the unfortunate crumbling of the, the respect um, that happens fairly early on, which, you know, we can see kind of right here when there's a really kind of um, moment of, you know, lightheartedness and there's some singing and he ends up joining in and doesn't end up going so well. Yeah, I, I love the scene for that very reason too. And, um, you know, I think that one of the things that happens when we discuss these hierarchy and, uh, and levels among the crew is the sense that that, that was a one-way street, right? Like, you know, that what we mean by that was that the lower levels weren't going to rise up and, and insult the upper levels. Um, you know, and, and going back to the Marines, right? Like that was one of the classic things the Marines were stationed in between to, you know, to keep the sailors up forward from murdering the officers back aft. Um, but in this case with Hallam, who so desperately wants to be liked uh, and be part of that community, he's violating those levels in the opposite direction. Uh, and the crew doesn't want him to be part of them. And as, uh, as Aubrey tells him later, uh, you know, chastising him. You don't have to be a tyrant, but you can't be their friend. They won't respect you. True. And then kind of what happens, of course, is that they, they do disrespect him by not saluting him. And, you know, one of the sailors ends up being flogged um, in this quite dramatic scene that was fairly accurate um, in terms of the public nature that was happening um, when a flogging did occur on a board ship. So you, we get to see kind of all of the other sailors in, as well as the um, officers respond to this flogging. That was something that happened both in the, the Royal Navy as well as the United States Navy. Yeah, this is another one of those things I think we often don't recognize uh, as having occurred within the U.S. Navy and even on Constitution. Um, you know, physical punishment, that corporal punishments did definitely still exist and, and you know, was commonly in use uh, from captain to captain or situation to situation. Um, but you're right, Jennifer, this was, it was, you know, it wasn't just about punishing the one guy who was on the rack. Uh, it was making sure everyone came to observe it and, and serve as that deterrent for future disobedience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this hierarchy that we see aboard the HMS Surprise is um, pretty much exactly what we see on the USS Constitution during the War of 1812, just on a, a slightly larger scale. Um, in this wonderful image from Stephen Biesti, you can see just the, the mass of people that would have been living and working aboard a warship of the time period. And you can see kind of the different ranks and, and where everyone would have been stationed. Yeah, this, um, this visual is actually another one that's off of our website and is um, available in a couple different places, actually. Um, both the uh, museum's uh, website as an explanation of crew ranks, uh, but also on our new website, A Sailor's Life for Me, <clears throat> excuse me, where you can explore these. You know, one of the things that's great about this is that showing the actual numbers, uh, and again, this is from Constitution, really gives you a sense of not only that hierarchy and the divisions, but you know, how they were taking up those spaces and, and how many of them there were. And uh, which is a, a reflection also, I think, of the jobs and responsibilities that they were each pursuing on board. Yeah. Um, Carl, we have a question here from Rick Kraft about any recommend recommendations for web resources to view research actual midshipmen's journals? I feel like we do. Yeah, actually, uh, we do. There are um, a couple of them that, uh, I always think, do we have them completely um, on our uh, website? Um, through the Explore Our Collection section of the USS Constitution Museum.org website, um, you can see uh, excerpts uh, from a couple different uh, midshipmen's journals. Um, I, I don't even know how many totally we have. In addition to the journals, we also have watch quarter station bills that were maintained by the lieutenants, which is another similar resource uh, that are like wonderful uh, to explore. Um, the deck log books that are available for download um, 
covering the cruise, the three major cruises of Constitution during 1812. Um, because one of those decalogues didn't exist uh, anymore, um, it is uh, represented um, by one of the midshipmen's journals. Cool. And a transcript of that is actually downloadable of all of those actually are downloadable as uh, printed transcribed uh, PDFs from the website. Yeah, our website is like a treasure trove. Um, once you kind of start digging a little bit, you just keep finding more and more. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're working hard to build those rabbit holes yeah. to keep you busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly doing it for me, so thanks, Carl. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Um, we do have another question um, from Bill Lewis um, that's just kind of curious about, you know, Captain Aubrey as we know um, him as a captain, but the, the, the title of the movie is Master and Commander. Um, so would he be a post-captain or not a Master and Commander? What would kind of his, his official title be? Uh, well, so it would it would probably depend on uh, you know the rank he was at, um, and uh, in you know the U.S. Navy was um, uh, nominally different, but this is also a reflection of O'Brien's work, and um, I suspect there are um, better O'Brien experts uh, among our audience, possibly even um, than I am. But it started out as um, Master and Commander was the first book that uh, Patrick O'Brien wrote not really anticipating that this was going to be as prolonged a series as it turned out to be. Um, and uh, uh, post-captain is uh, sort of off-duty, uh, you know, uh, unassigned. Um, and then there was, I, what was the third one? Do you remember, Jennifer? I, they go off from there, but each of the novels became more and more distinct. Um, I think the idea of Master and Commander as a title of both the movie and the book um, is a broader reflection of uh, the roles and the themes that that were, you know, under exploration here more than anything else. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah, I just want to go back to looking at this this crew chart for a second. It really is amazing to think of this mass of people aboard a ship like the HMS Surprise um, or the USS Constitution. We know from the very early scenes of the movie that the HMS Surprise has 197 people aboard. Constitution would have been closer to 450. Um, and really all of that was in service to the larger mission um, of the ship as well as just the, the daily requirements of being able to operate the ship which is the other kind of big theme that we see and we get to kind of explore in Master and Commander is, you know, um, this wonderful quote that the only things that keep this wooden ship together are hard work and discipline. So we just saw the discipline, which did not uh, seem very pleasant, but now let's take a little bit of a closer look at that hard work that was happening. Yeah, I, um, I love this quote for a couple of different reasons, um, and not the least of which is the reference to the, the, wooden, the little wooden world, um, a, a kind of common phrase. You know, the amazing part um, about both this depiction um, and life at sea in general uh, is that it is a microcosm. Um, you know, there's a paradox that comes with going to sea on a ship because on one hand, you are going out into the greatest, most open, broadest part of the world possible, um, the open ocean uh, that will take you to other unseen, you know, uh, parts of the world. And so your world appears to be opening up in grand and exciting ways, but at the same time, it has suddenly shrunk down to being, um, you know, the the couple hundred feet in either direction around you uh, and that and that few hundred people that you're sharing that tiny space with uh, beyond which, you know, you, you can't exactly leave. <laughs> yeah. Sounds a little bit like our, our staying safe at home a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> at least yeah. it goes in, uh, though. <laughs> being on a ship is being in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> Or as Samuel Jaisa said, you know, uh, being on a ship is being in jail. <laughs> um, so just to kind of give you a sense of 
the nature and the rhythm aboard a ship like the HMS Surprise and USS Constitution. This is kind of how the crew would have been divided. Um, in addition to the hierarchy aboard the ship, there was different watches. Um, you know, working on a warship required a 24-hour um, person crew to be able to man the ship both in kind of making sure that there is no enemy ship that is kind of sneaking up on you as well as just the the maintenance of requirements of to keep the the ship sailing so we get to see kind of in this wonderful chart that again is from our website just what is happening throughout the day for the different ranks aboard yeah and i think that this this 24-hour rhythm right is is one of the great uh, other aspects of the film is, is how well it sort of depicts depicts this. Um, you know, as we frequently say, uh, uh, Jason, I'd like to think of this as, you know, three big bulks of responsibility, right? You are maintaining the ship, you're operating the ship, uh, and you're training for the, the ultimate goal of the ship. Yeah. Um, and I think probably one of the things that just starts getting my blood kind of um, running is in the very beginning of the movie where we get to kind of see a little bit of the starts of this rhythm. And just to kind of remind people of that, we're gonna play you a little clip. I think what Alan just said in the chat, you know, being able to actually see everyone in that space really does bring it to life. And I think that that's something that Master and Commander um, does so well is it really does populate this these historic spaces that we're so used to kind of seeing empty or or full of tourists um, but it really gives you a sense of that rhythm and just kind of how tight and confined that space is yeah i think that there too it's another one of these cases where you know seeing this uh again uh, in existence is even uh, better uh, you know, whenever we can in, try, in terms of trying to uh, display and interpret uh, the ship at the museum uh, and with the active duty sailors on board, that, you know, we're not slinging up 400 hammocks, <laughs> so, <laughs> much less putting people, that many people in them. So yeah, yeah you don't get that sense until you, until you see it all together. Yeah. Um. And then you were talking about, Carl, kind of the different responsibilities that are depicted um, and that would have been happening aboard a ship. So kind of that daily maintenance is certainly one of the things of holy stoning um, or kind of sanding or scrubbing the deck. Um, and that would have been something that was happening every single day. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a wonderful sort of sequence to this opening of the movie that I really like that you know, we start with those, um, that changing of the watch and those functions that occur, you know, with every watch, right? Um, uh, and then it, it breaks it into sort of the rhythm of the day where we see the kinds of um, maintenance and upkeep and cleaning activities that would have been happening on, uh, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, and then it, it steps up from there, um, you know, and again, the Holy Stoning was something that, that was part of that. Uh, and then it steps up and we see them um, actually operating the vessel, right? Uh, you know, up in the rig, furling sails, setting, striking, um, uh, trimming sails, bracing yards, uh, things that, you know, may happen once in a day or could happen numerous times in a specific watch, depending on uh, changing conditions and the need uh, the need to change the sail plan, um, but again, you know the work of the vessel uh, and the work of, of the men on board doing that. Um, this is a great shot too, a screenshot from this because it gives us a sense of that perspective as well. Um, even on USS Constitution today, the active duty sailors who were assigned there, um, one of the questions they ask is, "Are you afraid of heights?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's something that we normally ask in our exhibits as well as on the A Sailor's Life for Me game. It's part of the recruiting questions. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that we see a lot of throughout this film, especially after the initial battle, are some really substantive uh, repair efforts that are happening on board. Um, and, you know, repair and maintenance and upgrade, up, upkeep were something that was going on all the time. 
but part of what makes that uh, gives Aubrey the, the leeway to make that decision to continue to pursue on uh, was his belief that he could make these, you know, large timber repairs underway, uh, even so much as, uh, um, you know, replacing a mast. Um, and we see uh, just the sheer number of bodies being put to these tasks and, and the ability to uh, craft and hew timber that was carried on board into the newly needed parts. Yeah, and I think that that would be something, you know, for someone that is more of a novice for our 28% of people that saw this movie either zero or one time, I think that the, the amount of repairs that could be done underway or in ports um, and just the redundancies that are available on a Navy ship is something that um, is really essential and something that you see in the movie and might be surprising if you're not familiar with ships of the time period. Yeah, the self-sufficiency was uh, was pretty impressive. Um, you know, and it, it it helped to find the endurance, right? That they yeah. had. Uh, you know, today we think, well, it, how far can you go? Is how much fuel you will have on board. Um, but when you know, when the fuel is free uh, in the form of the wind, then your endurance is uh, how much food and water you have on board, and your ability to keep the ship in operating order for as long as you can. Um. All right, so now we get to, to talk a little bit about, we've, we've talked about the daily routine that we get to see in Master and Commander and some of those, those odd tasks that would have happened either every few weeks or when repairs were needed. Um, but now we get to go into kind of the, the really exciting parts. Um, well, it's all exciting, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the really exciting parts to me, uh, parts of the movie, which is the battle scenes. Yeah, this is another great quote uh, that from when Aubrey is talking to the crew right before going into the main battle. And, you know, England is under the threat of invasion. And though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. Uh, this is great for so many reasons, right? Um, yeah. You know, the uh, England was under the threat of invasion, but they're on the far side of the world. Uh, which is a wonderful, succinct way of speaking to um, the nature of the, of the Napoleonic Wars as as a world war, um, you know, that this was England's under threat of invasion. Okay, great. Why are you in the South Atlantic instead of in the English Channel waiting to prevent that invasion, right? Uh, because that, you know, that globalized commerce was already part of uh, what they were out protecting and, and battling over in these far-flung places, so... Yeah, and I love the that this ship is England. The fact that this ship on the far side of the world is representing um, their country and is is kind of the sovereign land. Um, and you know, I think it really helps to up the ante by saying that the England is under threat of invasion. But of yeah. course, for, for those that are familiar with the books. Um, they're actually fighting a very different enemy. Um, they are fighting the fighting us, fighting the Americans um, versus this French privateer, the Akron. So yeah, in in I believe the the book that was titled Far Side of the World, um, and and I uh, I think that the the movie ended up being a bit of a sort of a mashup, um, yeah. and I can tell from some of the chat going on, we definitely have. Um, some really uh, strong O'Brien fans, maybe they can speak to some of this, that, uh, you know, Far Side of the World was a later novel in the series that, in which he's chasing an American ship, um, presumably based loosely on Porter and the Essex to the, to the Pacific uh, Theater, um, you know, mashed up with the, the thing of the first one. Uh, but, you know, according to the Great Legends, right, uh, they went with um, a French villain uh, because for the movie instead of American, uh, because Hollywood didn't think uh, Americans would want to watch uh, Americans as the villain in this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I, I know that the story is true, but I don't know if I, I would have mind so much. But it does kind of give us a little bit um, of fun in the fact that the Acheron looks very familiar to me. I don't, uh, does she seem familiar to you, Carl? Where have you seen this hall before, Jennifer? <laughs> I feel like right across from the museum. <laughs> oh my gosh, out my office window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she 
looks very similar to the, the USS Constitution. And in fact, her construction is based off of the USS Constitution. Um, and, you know, so I think it's kind of, is it a little far, for, you know, fetched that it is a French privateer that is built um, in Boston? <laughs> Maybe a little, uh, but I, I do kind of, I mean, that's why, that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this movie, right, is because the, the ship is um, so close to our hearts. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the idea that one of the other central aspects of this that makes this, um, you know, a dramatically interesting movie is the idea that um, that Aubrey on the surprise is, you know, outgunned and outnumbered yeah. by this, um, you know, would be frigate that is so. double its size, right? Yeah. Um, and that is, uh, that's pretty accurately reflected by the, um, you know, the impact that the, that the 44 gun American frigates and constitution among them, um, had on the British psyche when they went to sea and, uh, constitution and its battles with first carrier, then Java and later Cyan and Levant, uh, did have that impact of, wow, what, you know, what, what this is something new. Uh, and that newness consisted of uh, those two elements, right? A much larger hull for a frigate um, and uh, um, heavy framing and yet uh, an underbody that, um, that gave it uh, a lot greater speed. Yeah. Um, yeah, very technologically advanced. I think that, you know, Aubrey mentions like, this is the future. Um, and certainly it was a, a very successful design for USS Constitution. In fact, that's, you know, her nickname Old Ironsides comes from that really heavy um, framing and obviously her mix of white and live oak um, in her hull, but also because of the, the framing being so close. Yeah, for anybody who may be more of an O'Brien fan than a uh, than familiar with Constitution, um, you know, Constitution's nickname, Old Ironsides, comes mm -hmm. from uh, its first battle with HMS Guerrier, in which uh, those initial long-range shots from Guerrier were bouncing off the the hull of Constitution, and the hull, and the crew cried out, "Huzzah! Her sides are made of iron." Um, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, the idea of an armored side, uh, you know, uh, hull that led to this construction design uh, anywhere near so much as it was that the, the heavier, denser live oak that made up the framing of Constitution um, was, become, by virtue of its density, uh, more durable, longer lasting, uh, uh, albeit more expensive um, uh, to build, but that in doing so, um, that also provided some strength to the hull that allowed you to build out a design that could maintain uh, this underbody profile uh, and still carry a much greater number of larger, heavier guns. Yeah, pretty incredible. And I just want to, uh, we did share out in the chat this wonderful link um, out to the Smithsonian Channel that I hope you will um, you know, right click and open up in a different window and watch at your own time. It shows the impact of different shots against different types of hull. And it really gives you a visualization of just the damage um, and the protection that the hull um, of USS Constitution had for its sailors. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the fighting too, the, you know, the, when we talk about gunnery and um, and damage to the hull, uh, it brings us down to the gun deck and to the really sort of raison d'etre of the ships, uh, which is uh, firing uh, at each other. And one of the, I think, really great aspects of this movie is the, um, the demonstrations of the vessel as, or these gun teams as a teamwork, as a really highly orchestrated um, group that is practicing and training and doing it over and over again, improving their time uh, that they can, you know, uh, walk through all these steps. Um, there is a, a synchronicity of choreography and an expertise to that that I think is rarely really reflected in, in movies. 
Yeah, but you get to see kind of on USS Constitution, at least we know that Isaac Hull would have them practice at their guns to kind of help build up that muscle memory of being able to fire the guns quickly and accurately, just kind of like we see in the movie, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I believe in, um, on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeffrey, on a sailor's life for me too. I think we can actually yes. walk through um, all of the steps that would have gone into firing one of the 24 pound long guns on Constitution. You can indeed, and then you can try um, aiming and, and seeing if you are very accurate or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really fun game. Maybe a little less historically detailed in terms of what it takes, but it's always fun to shoot barrels in the water. <laughs> that's true. That is true. Um, all right. So I did actually see this come up in the one of, as one of our questions um, from Delaney, actually. So... Um, she was asking if we could please to discuss the tradition of naming the guns, if this is accurate, and tell us the names of the guns on USS Constitution. So this is one of my favorite little details that is in the movie that, again, is in that early scene. Um, so we see kind of sudden death here. We do know that kind of because of the, the teamwork that was required to fire the guns, oftentimes the guns did end up being named. I don't know if they would have been etched in the side quite like we see here or more if it was um, within the tradition of that particular gun crew. Um, but we do know of at least one name of a gun that was on USS Constitution because it appears on a powder horn from one of the sailors and that name is Big Will. Yeah, I think that's the only one that we actually know that was actually on Constitution. Um, that survives um again i think you're right I, I i suspect you're right jeff it's because of that um you know that sort of almost oral localized tradition uh, mm -hmm. keep in mind too you know when you think about uss constitution if you haven't been on board before there are guns on board uh, but they are not original guns they were cast and manufactured at the beginning of the 1900s and the gun carriages uh, like we see sudden death inscribed on here uh, have certainly been replaced uh, over and over on a regular basis as uh, you know they they rot away or are damaged, uh, and certainly would have been the case too at the time. However, if you do visit USS Constitution, or um, as is the case these days, if you're watching one of the guided tours online uh, of the ship, you you may very well see the names of of guns inscribed over the gun ports. And uh, although I think just about nearly everyone, uh, would you say, Jennifer, I'm not 100% sure, but I'd have to think about it, uh, <laughs> is given a name. But, you know, yeah. again, only one from Constitution, but um, a number of them drawn from, uh, from the other U.S. frigates that, that we knew more gun names about. Yeah, I don't believe, um, I'm trying to think on the spar deck if the gun names are there. I know definitely on the gun deck, you yeah. can see the placards. Um, and those names, as you mentioned, are taken from the USS United States and the USS Chesapeake. Um, yeah, I think so, it's just the long guns yeah. on the gun deck. Yeah, I think so too. We need to, we need to get back and get aboard. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Looking forward to that day, as I'm sure everybody yeah. is. Um. Yeah, so this kind of all the preparation that went into, you know, getting ready for battle certainly pays off, right? When all of a sudden you hear the drum roll um, to beat to quarters and you need to prepare for battle. And that is something that we get to see depicted in the movie. Um, yeah, this opening scene, and I think we have a clip. Of, yeah, this opening okay. scene that we have a clip of or this opening battle scene where they think they see someone uh, and then, you know, the uncertain uh, midshipmen call beat to quarters, even though they're not sure what they saw in the fog bank, uh, is just wonderfully evocative at so many different levels, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Jennifer and I, when we were talking about making a clip for this to, to participate, we're like, where do we start this? Where do we end this, right? <laughs> because, like, you know, we, we want to show the entire process all over again. Um, uh -huh. You know, the, the collapsing of the bulkheads uh, down oh, below, you know. Such the, a great shot. <laughs> right? And, the, you know, the choreography of, uh, of that, again, like you were saying, Jennifer, muscle memory, right, of, of like, this is the steps that have to happen and have to happen immediately and swiftly because we're under threat. 
Um, but that threat, as we see here, is is you know uncertain at best, and then unfolds incredibly dramatically. All right, let's take a look. In Constitution's history, that um, you know, while there was a an attrition nature, attritional nature to the fire in terms of the damage it was doing to both the crew, the rigging, the hull itself. Uh, you know, there was the potential for that that one critical hit too that could have a real disabling effect. Yeah. Um, and certainly we see that in a number of instances in, in the narratives of Constitution's battles. Yeah, absolutely. So as we kind of move forward from that, um, and that's kind of, you know, at the end of that battle, you know, they end up starting to use the atmosphere that they have the fog to be able to try to escape because of the um, the dominating nature of the Akron and the damage that they've taken. So there's a lot of kind of deception and using different tactics um, to try to kind of get the upper hand against the Akron. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't think um, in that, you know, you and Jennifer, you and I were talking about this rowing seed, right? Like, really? They were rowing that fast to escape from the ship that was sailing so fast uh, toward them that, you know, it had a bow weight going on? Yeah, probably not. Um, but, you know, in an absolute... to get to that fog. That's all I yeah, need. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in an absolute still wind, uh, you know, was it feasible? Um, you know, Constitution off of the coast of New Jersey on her first uh, foray during 1812 encountered an overwhelming number of uh, British ships and squadron and, and decided to try and flee. And as they sought to do so, uh, the wind died for both them and the ships that were attempting to pursue them. Uh, and they put out longboats not to directly row the vessel, but to kedge, to carry a small anchor forward, drop it, and, uh, and let the ship uh, kind of you know leapfrog with the anchor along and over the course of three days of doing that, managed to escape. Um, so there too, that operational nature, although it may have been a little exaggerated in that case, is great too. Yeah. But the deception part, you know, here this smaller ship is trying to gain an upper hand against this larger ship. And in the wonderful, like, you know, final confrontation of this movie, they disguise themselves as a whaler with the thick black smoke. And, uh, and I think as Aubrey put it, the lubberly, you know, sailing maneuvers, um, don't look too sharp up there. Yeah. Uh, and it lures the ship in close enough that they can do the damage. Yeah. What is that damage? Um, so, of course, they are able to, to set that trap. Um, and this is kind of what part of the scene that you wanted to talk about, Carl. So let, let's show it. And it relates to kind of something that you referenced before, right, with just the... Yeah, this is... Uh, it, this doesn't seem like much on the surface, but I, I really um, appreciate the scene. Um, and if, if, you know, if you go back and look at it again, even because it was done with the large scale models, um, even some of the, the real elements of the weight of this rig really coming down. It, you know, in our museum, um, we have a number of paintings of, of the ship, the British ships that were dismasted in battle with Constitution. And, uh, yeah, there's a, there's something very passive about it uh, because they were painted either in the aftermath of it um, and rarely demonstrated or conveyed like the just the scale of the violence of it. Um, but having, you know, this was being able to take down the mast of the enemy ship uh, obviously was disabling their engines, uh, but it did an incredible amount of potential damage. Uh, as we see in the storm section of the movie later on, you know, when they lose a section uh, of the upper mast, they're forced to cut it away because it's dragging them down. And here, too, that would have been the case. Uh, and, you know, when it doesn't seem that uh, big, I, I, I'm fond of telling people, you know, when you think about how dramatic it is if a tree falls down, you know, on your car or your house or your yard, uh, during a storm common up here in New England, um, then, you know, you begin to get a sense of how dramatic that is. Only imagine the tree is a, uh, you know, 200 foot tall oak <laughs> yeah. with, with all of its associated branches. And right above you. 
Yeah, and right above you. And oh yeah, and by the way, you may have been actually climbing up in it when it came down. Yeah. Um, and of course that bringing down the mast and disabling some of the maneuverability of the ship is a, one of the things that allows them to be able to kind of get close enough to, to actually board uh, the Acheron, which we can kind of see here. Though they're not, I mean, they are close enough that they're, they're <laughs> using kind of the, the, the hooks to, to kind of try to get a little bit closer as well. Yeah, you know, the boarding is, I feel like boarding is a feature of, uh, of every, uh, you know, maritime age of sail movie, right? Like, you know, as our, if our movie time, if our maritime movie club takes off, we'll, we'll probably be talking a lot more about boarding in the future, right, Jennifer? I think so. Um, in this case, you know, boarding um, frequently was the result of, of a, a, you know, a need to uh, come across after ships had uh, uh, unintentionally collided. Um, yeah, the, as we see with the, the Constitution and the HMS Guerriere, where they, there is an almost boarding party, um, and then eventually, you know, unfortunately, that is when, with, you know, Lieutenant William Bush, um, you know, dies, but the ships separate, and there is actually no boarding party at that point. Yeah, boarding is a fairly precarious, um, you know, uh, decision to make, because you are, uh, really giving up the sense of control that you you have over the situation, uh, you know, ideally, and this is why, you know, Aubrey wants to lure them in closer to begin with, because otherwise this larger, heavier ship could lay off at a greater distance out of the range of the, the guns of surprise and just batter it away, uh, which was an effective tactic uh, for a lot of larger ships here. Um, but they, you know, having dismasted it and feeling like they're on the step, they they take the next step toward boarding. Yeah, and part of that, of course, is using our Marines um, with their 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 guns to be able to to fire into the enemy to kind of try to disarm anyone that wasn't uh, injured by the mass falling. Yeah, the uh, the Marines are not only we see the Marines in a couple of places and these battle scenes, which is kind of great. They're in their traditional role up in the tops as sharpshooters. Uh, in this opening scene, and then they are uh, charging into the fray across. Yeah. Um, you know, before we move off this, it, it, one other thing that occurs to me that um, is kind of fascinating about this, I'm thinking about it because I saw the officer here. The, um, the great thing about the closing out of this big, big dramatic battle scene, I think, too, is the uncertainty of whether it's actually over, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we we don't really know when uh, when they've completely taken the ship. And so, um, you know, there's still a little bit of chaos and lingering uncertainty among the crew. And I, I think there was actually even, a, you know, a scene somewhere where Aubrey says, uh, have they struck their colors? Well, we're yeah. not sure, but we pretty much got them. Right. Yeah, and then of course the the surrendering of the sword um, by the surgeon. Um, <laughs> the surgeon, yeah. Surgeon. Sorry to give it away for anyone who didn't actually watch the movie yet. Um, <laughs> but of course that kind of sets us up for the next, what they certainly hoped would have been the next adventure, right? Is that, you know, the battle is done they, they put a, a party aboard the Acheron to be able to, to sail her in. Um, and then the potential that there was another deception that they now have to go and, and check on. Yeah, yeah it, it was pretty wonderfully set up for a sequel, I think, yeah. um, which is really sad that it didn't happen. And uh, I, I do love the boarding, um, excuse me, the prize crew too. You know, the, yeah. the idea that this is the young lieutenant's opportunity uh, at command is certainly um, historically accurate in terms of, um, you know, this was frequently the case where the, the young officer's first um, real opportunity at commanding a vessel was taking a, a prize crew and, and taking a, you know, a prize vessel back to port. Yeah. I know, I, I'm really disappointed, as I'm sure a lot of people are, that there was not a sequel, um, including, I think, Russell Crowe, who occasionally on Twitter is is still trying to <laughs> get it made. <laughs> well, you never know. It might work out for him, right? Uh, uh, it, it certainly is that 
similar things have happened with other franchises being resurrected. Um, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, everyone in the maritime community uh, bemoans the fact that this uh, more of these weren't able to get made. Uh, certainly, I think the director and producers had anticipated this becoming a franchise. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this was made in 2003, came out, um, which suffered from horrible timing on a number of fronts. Um, I, you know, two years uh, after 9-11 uh, and in the the beginnings of the throes of the Iraq War, um, the you know I think that um, Americans may have been uh, less interested in seeing this kind of historical and and realistic uh, depictions of battle. Uh, but you know at the same time, um, Captain Jack was uh, competing. This Captain Jack uh, was competing with uh, um, with the other captain. Um, the Pirates came out the same year, is that right, the first one? Yeah, yeah it, just... it did very well, and obviously has had lots of sequels. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so Push Game to Shove, America's wanted uh, Pirates of the Caribbean more than the accurate uh, Royal Navy. Yeah. Uh, and it was also competing with Lord of the Rings, uh, which I think is second to one of the, second or third, I can't remember now, of these came out that year, too. So, uh very sad, uh, but if Russell's out there making a, a pitch for it too, then um, uh, Russell, if you're watching, we're right behind you. We'll be buying tickets uh, as soon as you get this next one made. Yes, we support you. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and as I said, the um, you know, the uh, HMS Surprise, uh, the former HMS Rose, uh, is, uh, is uh, still at the San Diego Maritime Museum. Uh, and a number of other similar uh, replica ships have been built uh, since then that are uh, you know, sailing the world's oceans right now, um, participating in sail training and, uh, and historical interpretation. Uh, the uh, a French frigate, a replica of a French frigate came to visit the US last year that was built since this movie was made um, that is remarkably, again, in line with uh, these depictions. Um, and a couple other similar ones have been built since. Yeah. Um, so, Carl, do we want to answer some of the, the questions that we've gotten in our Q&A? Yeah, um, I've been kind of glancing over at the chat here as we've been talking, but I haven't actually uh, seen the questions. What do we got? Yeah, so um, one of the things is the British favored firing at hulls, the French at rigging. Did the U.S. have a preference um, from Jason? So, um, it, you know, in part um, that... Uh, the origins of, of that idea of British and French distinctions in, in doctrinal firing uh, echoes back to fairly early on in the development of, of fleet command and control uh, and the development of these broadside, um, you know, armed uh, naval ships. Um, I, I have not seen in the, the, the work you've done uh, a specific sort of, you know, uh, doctrinal direction along those yeah. lines. If it's feasible to do so, um, and you think you can be successful, uh, taking down the rig is definitely preferential in that if you can preserve the hull, you can tow it back to port and refit it and make use of it as one of your own. And that certainly happened a lot uh, with both the US and Royal and French navies during this time period um, where uh, you know ships came swapped back and forth as prizes. And as long as the hull was able, you know, in good enough shape to be repaired, it could go back into service. Um, so that can't happen if you're firing directly at the hull with the intent of sinking it, uh, which was also a little bit, you know, less likely to be the immediate outcome of the battle. The battle would likely um, be brought down by either the ship's inability to maneuver and bring its gun to bear, or the fact that you killed so many of their crew that they could no longer operate the guns. Um, but if the damage to the hull was too extensive, then you faced the proposition of losing the vessel as a whole. And that certainly happened in the case of Constitution with both Guerrier and Java, where the Constitution did not sink the ships in battle, um, but took them as prizes. And then once they went aboard, realized that both hulls were in too bad a shape to make it back to port to be rehabilitated as prizes and were scuttled on the spot. Yeah. 
Um, so Brent is wondering um, something that we certainly see in the movie. Sometimes we hear that the splinters were worse than the cannonballs, but these cannonballs look pretty dangerous. Uh, what do the records say about the relative dangers of splinters and cannonballs? Well, I think, you know, when we say that, uh, the thing to keep in mind is the breadth of damage that's being done, right? Um, you know, a, a ball enters through a, a wooden wall, a bulkhead, um, a bulwark, and um, as, it, as it enters cleanly, it comes out the backside and blows outward. And so if you are in the wrong position, uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time, you as an individual person may be uh, hit and killed by that ball. Uh, and there are, in fact, um, historical and anecdotal evidence of uh, crew members being uh, literally beheaded and dismembered um, by, by cannonballs. Um, but the potential of the splinters, and when we say splinters, we're not talking not about small. the paper cut kind <laughs> of, um, you know, really just shredding apart um, human limbs and bodies was far more significant. So for every ball, there are literally hundreds or even thousands of these shards of wood that are, are devastating. Where the balls had um, a greater impact than the splinters, however, is not in the damage to crew, but in the damage itself to the vessel. And, and again, we come back to that aiming and firing and, uh, and fire direction of, you know, what did you want to take down? Um, and we have actually great sketches in Constitution Museum that we just recently acquired that we're still working on finding a provenance for, but that were purportedly done by a crew member and show um, the detailed sketching of the cannon damage done to a mast after the battle. Oh, wow. That sounds incredible. Um, and I know that in terms of preparing for this movie, something that the historical consultant did was look at kind of those, those butcher bills, the, you know, the death um, records and the injury records. Um, and, you know, so the, the splinter damage was, was certainly accurate. Yeah. yeah as, a, as damage to the human crew, certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I do see, and this might be more of a question for some of our audience um, that maybe some have, have already answered, is are there any other series that you recommend? Maybe the Hornblower books? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave that to our audience. Um, you know, O'Brien is certainly not the first, um, and, uh, uh, and depending on your perspective, maybe not even the least of the authors who have uh, produced series uh, like this. Um, I think what has made O'Brien stand sort of uh, above the rest uh, was the historical accuracy he put into not only the nautical elements of it, um, but again, like I had said, that, that sort of, um, you know, the time period uh, it has spawned um, almost a secondary publishing industry uh, of books about the geography of O'Brien stories, the, um, you know, the politics and the language, the food, uh, the, the songs, music, you know, all of that. Um, and I think that immersion is, is part of the appeal of those. Uh, Horatio Hornblower by Forrester, uh, somebody mentioned, is one of the earlier ones, um, probably a little bit more melodramatic. Uh, I saw someone else mention in our chat earlier a couple of the other ones um, that I can't recall off the top of my head which ones they were now. Um, but yeah, there are, are a variety of those the uh, entire series. Uh, Jim Nelson is an author who in the 1990s uh, began producing a, a similar series, but based on, um, uh, based on American uh, uh, Captain. Um, and then Kate is asking, in real life, would a ship so much smaller and outgunned have been expected to take on such a superior vessel? I think this is, this is kind of going back to one of our first questions of, you know, is it, is it prudent to actually go and chase this, this larger vessel, or is it better, especially if you were damaged, to turn back around? 
Um, yeah, I think that I think that David and Goliath aspect of it is part of what makes it, you know, kind of an appealing story, right? Mm -hmm. the, this is where they are under, you know, outmanned, outgunned, but it's the strength of the crew and its training and, and seamanship that carries the day for them. How realistic is that? Uh, I think we see evidence that, at least evidence that the role of that training and preparation of the crew played a huge fundamental um, impact in the success and outcome of any given battle, um, more so than I think we sometimes give it credit for. And certainly there's you know, no battle uh, in the American side that more represents that than the, the loss of the Chesapeake at the Shannon, where uh, Philip Broke, uh, the British captain, had trained immensely with his crew and was ready to go and, and was, you know, essentially the Aubrey of his time and Chesapeake went out uh, unready, unprepared and, and untrained and, and was pretty rapidly lost as a result. Yeah. I guess I, I do want to just point out that it's not, I think that there's maybe because we see, you know, the HMS surprise go up against the Acheron and this other kind of glorification, there were in fact times where it was more prudent to outrun um, the enemy. You know, we certainly see that with, with USS Constitution um, where it's not on their side. And, you know, the United States had a limited amount of ships and, and sailors. And sometimes that was the, the more prudent decision. I'm just making a case for it. I'm just making a case. <laughs> no, I'm right there with you. And so were the, you know, so were the commanders. That's the reason Hull went to such great efforts to try and escape that squadron in New yeah. Jersey, right? And it's the same reason that Stuart was uh, trying to get away from the ones off of Marblehead. And once he got into Boston, it's the same reason the Constitution stayed bottled up in Boston for most of that year, because the the blockade was effective enough even to keep her from getting out to, you know, to fight against effective numbers. Yeah. Um, well, I think that we could just keep talking about master and commander for a very long time. <laughs> there, and as we mentioned, there's so much detail to explore um, and there's so many connections to USS Constitution um, that we could just continue to go on and we certainly, you know, would love to hear from you if you do have follow-up questions that you want to explore um, or if you want to dig in a little bit more into the history of USS Constitution. Uh, we certainly recommend our website at USSCM.org um, where you can find out kind of upcoming events as well as dig into some of those um, research that Carl has been doing and see some of our artifacts and um, that online, which is really cool. Yeah, I apologize. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of the questions I'm scanning yeah. through and I'm seeing even more and they'll continue to go on. Uh, feel free to you know continue to post them, and we'll uh, we'll look for ways to answer your questions either directly. You can always query our um, if you've got specific, more detailed research questions. You can always query us at the USS Constitution Museum. Uh, we have a little bit more delayed uh, time frame now uh, under the given the current pandemic circumstances, um, but we are continuing to respond to to those requests as we get them, and uh, let us know what you think. Yeah, and also let us know if you want to see another uh, Maritime Movie Club. Me and Carl are currently debating <laughs> about the next one. Uh, so I am I am Team Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, <laughs> I really want us to watch Captain Ron. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I think they are both fun. So uh, we may be sending out a survey. So if you want to give us your opinion about what to watch next, uh, we would love to hear from you and to get your feedback about how today went. Um, we certainly appreciate you joining. And we will also be um, sending a link to where you can rewatch um, this webinar if you are so inclined. Yeah, this will be recorded and kept. Uh, and thanks for coming, everybody. I'm seeing the chat streaming. Oh my God, there's movie ideas already coming over uh, <laughs> from other people on addition to the other ones. So uh, Maritime Movie Club may, be, may very well be back and uh, some of it may be more fun and lighthearted uh, and less concerned with the historical accuracy and connection. But, uh, but there are also a lot of movies out there that continue to provide really wonderful insight 
into history. So thanks everybody for joining us uh, in this unique venture tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Have a nice night. Yeah, have a good night.